right, find your way in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, uh, right there towards the end of the New Testament. So when you're looking on your device and you gotta get all the way down towards almost the back to uh, Revelation, then go back a little bit. Hebrews, uh, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and then Revelation. No, we're not getting through all that this morning. But as we look at the scriptures, uh, studying through the book of Hebrews, let me encourage you, let me, let me remind you that this book was written and as the book of Hebrews was written in its day for the purpose of encouraging the church that was in danger of turning away from Christ. It's, it's really written to, in many ways, the persecuted church. Those that would be living in the world, those that would have the pressures to turn away from God. And we live in a current world that the, the pressures from the outside are great for us simply to, to deny the word of God. And we, we need this help. So we come today where we're in chapter three. It says, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Now, if there was one thing I tried to communicate with you last week in the, out of the first study of the book of Hebrews, I wanted you to be able to see Jesus, to know him, to love him, and to follow him. If, if, if you got nothing else out of last week's Bible study and it carries into this week, that you would see Jesus Christ and you would know him and you would love him and you would follow him. Well, today, just exchange see for hear, that you would hear Jesus and that you would hear Jesus and know him and you would follow him and that you would love him with all of your life. Because when it comes down to it, it says, holy brethren, we were made holy brethren by the cross of Jesus Christ. God in heaven left heaven, became man in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, dies on the cross for our sin and for the sin of the world, resurrects from the dead, and at that point of his suffering, he then gives us the right to become children of God when we believe him and when we receive him. A simplicity that is important and the, the simple truths and the deep truths of who Jesus Christ is is very important in the days when, when, the, when the enemy is throwing all kinds of attacks against what's true and what, what is the word of God and what's said about the word of God. It doesn't take very long. I mean, all you have to do is tune in to, your, to our local resident atheist who gets uh, publishing time in our local paper and you'll get all the things and all the garbage that, that attacks the word of God. Listen, it's not about the current issues. It's not about what, what people say is right and wrong. The real battle is what God has said and whether or not we as Christians and we in the church can hear Jesus in this day and age and will stay with what he said. See, because when it comes down to it, our holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, how do we become a partaker? Well, we identify with him in his death to sin, and we then die with him, suffering with him, right? You just, you wanna suffer? You wanna know what the sufferings of Christ are in this world? Say no to sin. Say no to all that temptation that says, you know, that, that you should sin against God's word. And say, if you're today, you're a Christian and you're a stranger to the sufferings of Christ, go to the word of God and hear what Jesus says to you today. So we're gonna get through three and four today. We're gonna take a look at this in such a way that in this place of being a partaker, Apostle is sent one. The Father sent the Son into the world. That, that's pretty clear. The high priest, meaning this, Jesus Christ represented us to God the Father on our behalf and he offered up the blood sacrifice to pay for the sin of the world. Our high priest, Jesus Christ, and hold fast our confession. See, the whole thing today to encourage the church that I would encourage you, who is Jesus Christ and your confession, your good confession? Paul says to Timothy, your good confession that you made in view of all people. This is what baptism is about, really, you think about it. You publicly renounce sin and become a partaker with Jesus Christ in his death to sin. You go under the water, you die to sin, and you rise with him coming out of the water to live that new life, and you publicly confess that he is your Lord and Savior, and your confession of who he is in your life. You say, I'm trusting in him that he paid my debt for my sin, and I'm saved by his name. See, we come to this good confession, and in the, being this partaker, we began this study in Hebrews, and it's very, very important. Very important that you get this today. God has spoken by his son, Jesus Christ. God has spoken. God came. The, the revelation of God in the person of Jesus Christ, he came teaching the word of God. He came speaking. He came uh, healing, he came forgiving. He came dying on the cross. And that you would understand there is a salvation message in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that mankind, man and woman alike, right, can be saved by faith in Jesus Christ, what he did for them on the cross. And as you become a partaker of that, it's also the sufferings of the cross. And then there's this other thing that, that kind of goes through here. As a partaker, you're to be one with him. And in that oneness with him, now, you're also a partaker of his temptations. Because the Bible's very clear that he was tempted in all ways, and he is able to help you. 
See, the persecuted church in this day and age, and for us today, the persecution really comes to deny God's word and to deny the person of Jesus Christ, his identity. The world and the pressure outside, the flesh inside, the temptations of Satan, Christ faced them all. As a man, Jesus faced those temptations. He is able to help us who are being tempted in our day and age. What's the temptation? Satan comes to to tempt us to sin against God and his word. It's that straightforward that we have a high priest, we have an apostle, we have one we partake with who is able to help. Look to the helper. See, God, by his spirit, now lives in the church, members individually of one another, and as I get you today to hear Jesus Christ, God has spoken by Jesus Christ, and I, you know, I, I just don't want this today to be one, another study or you're listening on the radio or maybe you come across this teaching in the archive and, and sometime in the future somebody comes across this teaching and it's just like words, 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 words and you go on your way. I want the word of Christ to come into your heart and to dwell there richly. I am tired of the birds snatching up the word of God from people's lives. Word is sown, word is sown, but because of the hardness of heart, Satan comes along with his minions and he snatches up the word of God all over the place and you're ended up with a, with a weak and a, and a mitiated, if that's the right word, if I'm pronouncing it right, you know what I mean, uh, a lame church because we haven't taken God's word into our hearts and we haven't uh, done what he has said. See, we need this warning today. Last week's warning was take heed lest you drift away. Now, If you didn't take heed, if you didn't go back last week and actually re-examine, am I on course, could you be drifting? Could it be today, you know, you're sitting here today and you're hearing words say, that's for other people. Or you're saying, well, he's not talking to me, or that's not what the Spirit of God is saying. But the scriptures, the word of God is sharp, it's living and powerful, it's too cut to the heart that we would reconsider, are we drifting? I mean, could we actually examine a time period Uh, in our lives, our Christian walk, our relationship with Jesus Christ, and we could actually see that we used to do uh, things that were closer to him, and we've drifted away, and now we're looking at other things. We got our eyes on idols. We got our eyes on the world. We got our eyes on the news. We got our eyes on ISIS. We got our eyes on something else. We got our eyes on our own pleasures. We got our eyes on our bank account, okay? We got our eyes elsewhere, and that's when you know you've drifted. If you've been serving money, today's the day to come back. And you say, this this whole thing of saying, I serve Jesus Christ. He's my help. The temptations that came in his life, I want to walk forward with him and I want to hear what he has to say. So when we talk about our confession, our good confession, it it is about Jesus Christ. So verse 2 says, "He who was faithful, Jesus, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him, who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more glory than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope from to the end. So very clearly just saying, Jesus is better than Moses. Moses was a faithful servant, got the law, uh, led the people out, led them out of Egypt, performed God's miracles, did all that God wanted him to do. He was faithful to the end for 40 years of complaining and sinning people, nagging him, wanting to, to get rid of him, and he would intercede and he would fast and pray. And that was Moses' life. It wasn't the pleasant wilderness life for Moses, and he was faithful. Yet Christ is the one who built the house. Christ is faithful unto his Father. Christ Jesus always did the will. So the cross, fully in view here, that we would understand the cross is greater, the grace of God greater than the law, that today, can you hear Jesus? I mean, would it be that you're drifting, and and you've been a Christian now, and, and you're drifting as such where you no longer can come to the Bible and just hear Jesus talk to you? That, that somehow you read the words now and you've got to go beneath the words, around the words, over top of the words, exchanging words, dictionary words, and you cannot hear your good shepherd anymore. I'm bringing it back today, just simply what you heard in the beginning, is that have you heard Christ Jesus? And if today you've never heard his voice and you don't know him and he's not your good shepherd and you've been listening to other voices and, and your lives are such where you're like, you're, you got all these distracting voices and you got things, do this, don't do that, feel good, do this, do that, whatever it is, come back to Jesus and hear his voice. See, because he's faithful, and it says holding fast the confidence. See, it is about Jesus. 
It is about what he's done. It is about our confession of who he is because we secure that, right, by the power of God in us, by the spirit of God coming and being placed within us. We secure that confidence. Say, we know who Christ is. We've heard him. We're going to follow him. So now we get into this today. See, well, I thought we were already in it. No, that's the introduction. Now as we get into this, my whole thing for you today is that this is not just words, but today's like, this is the word of God. I hear Jesus talking in the book of Hebrews. Because verse 7, the writer of Hebrews says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says. And then he goes to quote Psalm 95. Then he goes, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, denotes that the Old Testament was inspired by the Holy Spirit. We know that David wrote it down. But the author here says it's the Holy Spirit speaking through David that you can trust the Spirit of God speaking in the Word. This is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6. See, this is to be able to take the Word of God and the Word of the Spirit and apply it into these situations in life. And it would be today that you would hear these words right there in verse 7, and it applies today. Today, if you will hear his voice, capital H, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the days of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now, the writer here of the Hebrews pulls from Psalm 95 and talks about the children of Israel after Egypt in their rebellion in the days of Moses, how they resisted what God said to do. It's that straightforward. They rebelled against the command of God. God says, go up into the promised land. They say, no. Then they realize that when they said no to go up into the promised land, because there's giants in there, two out of the 12 said, we can do it. They're the only two that made it through in that age group for an entirety of 40 years. And God said this. God says, you're not going to go into the promised land. And you know what they did the next day? When they refused to listen to God, you know what they did the next day? Okay, we'll go up now. And then God tells Moses, tell him not to go up. Moses, the, the Ark of the Covenant was there. They were not led up then. You know what would have happened had they obeyed God? Had they listened to his voice, God would have taken up day or night the, the, the cloud or, or pillar of fire. Either one would have been taken up and he would have led them right into the promised land into victory. But they would not listen to God. So the whole thing is for you and I, and we get into this, can you hear Jesus' voice? Because what is he leading you to do? What is he leading us to do? What are the scriptures leading for us to do? Because we can learn from the past mistakes of others. You can learn from others' mistakes. Wow, wouldn't that be just a novel idea in the body of Christ? To learn from somebody else's mistakes instead of making the rounds on this sin and then making the rounds on that sin and backsliding here and loving the world there and all these things. Nothing new under the sun. What you're into right now, if it's not Jesus, has already been done. Come back today. Come back to the voice of Jesus Christ. Listen to him and, and do what he says. See, because if you can hear my voice today, and I hope you can, but can you hear the voice of Jesus when you come to the scriptures? So the idea of not hardening your hearts. Hardened, obstinate, I will not do what Jesus wants me to do. Christians really are that way? Yeah. I didn't know this at first because what was happening for me when I found the word of God and God began to work in me, I really thought, I really, this is how naive I was when I, when I got done with all the 10 years of backsliding and I got with Christ and I found his word, I found the teaching of God's word and I was hungry for God's word and I found it in here, I started changing my opinions. I started changing my life. I just thought that's what everybody did. Now that I pastor a church, I'm like, wow, I wish somebody would do that where they come to the scriptures and, and, and their lives are changed because this hardness is obstinate. Now, the day of trial in the wilderness, what did God do with them? He, he led them wander in the wilderness for 40 years and he tried their lives. But really, what were they doing all along? They were rebelling. There was a hardness. They were testing God all along. And so that we would learn these things. And I think from the context of what we're getting into today, I think verse 10 is helpful. They always go astray in their hearts. Would not listen to God's word. And, and what, what were their horrible sins in the wilderness? What were their greatest sins in the wilderness? Things like complaining. Do you know that God equated for the children of Israel in their rebellion in the wilderness when they were upset at God because God made them go the long way around, they started to complain against God. And you know what God did? God corrected their behavior. He did. Just like in sexual immorality, just like uh, they had the, the graves of craving where they said, give us meat or we're going to die. They started to speak against the miracles of God. God fed them supernaturally and they started to complain against God. They go astray in their heart, hardness of heart. So will we if we don't hear Jesus today. Just like it happened to them, and you today might be in danger. Last week's danger was danger of drifting. You know what today's danger is? 
hardness of heart, no longer willing to hear what Jesus says to do, doing your own thing, complaining, right? Changing what, what, what sin is, changing all kinds of things in the scripture. I don't want to be that way. So when he says, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now, maybe this is a debate for those of you commentaries, Hebrews 3, 4, what's, what's this rest of God? Is it heaven? Is it, is it the filling of the Holy Spirit? Well, let's use the context of the Bible. David is a shepherd. David pens Psalm 95. This is quoting Psalm 95. We read it in introduction this morning. We are the people. We are the sheep we are, uh, of his pasture. We're the people of his hand, or the sheep of his hand. This here, this idea of entering his rest from Psalm 95 you need to understand this. This is the place where you enter into the fold. This is the sheepfold. This is the place where you're safe. This is the place of rest. See, if the sheep are, are grazing and at night they would come into the sheepfold, they would be kept safe in there. And the shepherd would lay down and he would be the door. Jesus said, he's the door. It's John chapter 10 all over again. If you're familiar enough with John 10, you're like, this is the place of rest. It's found in a person. The place of rest is found in the person of Jesus Christ. And he says what? My sheep know my voice. I go ahead of them. I call after them and they follow me. Listen, if you cannot hear his voice, no, that's not what it says. If you will not hear his voice, you won't follow him. But if you're listening, you're tuning your ear as a child of God, as a Christian, as a sheep, and you're tuning your ear to other voices, You'll follow after those other voices. But Jesus said, those who are my sheep, they will not follow another voice. And what's the exhortation then today? Be careful in your hearts that they're not hardened to what Jesus really says to you. Because as Jesus talks, you're to hear him, he's your good shepherd. He's going to lead you out into green pasture, he's going to lead you back in. The place of rest is the sheepfold. And now you just stay in the sheepfold. You stay there. You, you remain there. You, it's, it's the place of of comfort. It's the place of rest. It's the place of safety. It's the place of presence of Jesus Christ in your life. Now, I think with the context, right, and, you know, I'm going to do this. Let's go over to John 10. So instead of me just talking about it, let's, let's read the word of God. Because lo and behold, when we get to John chapter 10, and if you've got a red letter edition, guess what color these letters are going to be in? Man, so if you can hear the words of Jesus, then you don't hear me and, you know, let's pick, it up in, oh, let's pick it up in 10. We need to know this because, I mean, the thief is all around. The, the false shepherds all around. Look at verse 10. John 10.10. 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. You should be able to identify what's going on in the world right now. Where they're stealing and killing and destruction, that's where the enemy is at work. We know, we know that. The thief... Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep, and flees. The wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so, I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, that they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Again, a reference to the Gentiles, of which then we come under that, that other flock. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay my life down, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This command I've received from my Father. See, in the context now, David Shepherd, this whole thing is this, not to go astray. how they go astray? Hardness of heart. It's like Jesus given that parable about the seed and he's trying to sow the seeds into your heart. And, and even if he would take a, a uh, air pressure gun and try to, try to take that seed of God's word, he couldn't get through the hardness of the heart. See, because the hardness of the heart is what keeps the seed from coming in. And the warning of that whole thing was that when there's a hardness of heart, then, then Satan comes along, the birds come along, and snatch up that seed, and God's word never, ever grows there for a Christian's life. How many times, how many Bible studies, how many times going through the scriptures, how many, how many verses are just gone? Just gone. See, because the warning here today, and the whole thing is about hardness of heart. Let's learn from what happened to others that we as Christians can walk forward. You wouldn't believe the incredible power of God and the grace of God that abounds to those that humble themselves and simply come to God's word and say, Jesus, I want to follow you. 
teach me, show me. And, and this that place of humbling yourself and say, I will not resist the word of God. I will not turn against the word of God. If it's in there, I want it. Teach me, show me, help me. Because we have the same temptation and we have one who can help in our temptation. So beware, brethren, verse 12. Back in Hebrews 3, verse 12, beware, brethren. Beware the dog, all right? Beware the mutilation. What do you want to beware of? Well, he says, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. See, when the persecutions came, the church was in danger of what? I'm just not sure if this is worth it anymore. I'm just not sure it's worth it to serve Christ. See, but the, the realities are, that's, a, that's an evil heart of unbelief. I don't know why it is, but somehow the last... 20 years of my exposure to Christianity, of which now 15, 16 of those is back with the Lord instead of the backslidden view of Christianity, is this. I don't get it. Why would we say that doubt is okay? Why would we say, is that, oh, it's okay if you're doubting. It's okay if you're doubting. I heard that over and over again, and I, I hear the, rather the beware today. It's like, you know, beware if you're doubting. Come back to hear Jesus. If you can only hear simple things of Jesus, hear those. Don't worry about the stuff you don't have figured out. What has he said to you, work with that, that he has revealed to you in your heart. Beware, brethren, lest there be an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one, one another daily while it is called today. Consider yourself exhorted from the pulpit. Consider yourself exhorted in your personal lives, one-on-one -on -one when I speak to you. Exhort one another daily. And that you guys, let's cling to Jesus Christ. It says, exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. See, right now you might be hardened. You might actually be elsewhere. Your, your body's here, but you're planning something else out. I am fully aware that you can actually be here in person and be a million miles away. Blah, 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 blah. Vikings, pastor, you know, blah, blah. What am I going to eat? See, but when you get alone with Jesus and you get into that prayer closet and you open the Bible and you say, Jesus, open my heart, will you write there? Will you speak there? See, because the hardness of a deceitful uh, heart is deceived. The hardness comes through the deceitfulness of sin. Oh, that's not sin. It's okay. Every time it's just like a layer of hardening. Hardened. Hardened. So maybe this is today where if that's the case, then you must repent. It says, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Second reference here of our confidence to the end. Our confession in Christ, steadfast in him. You know what? Just if, even if you're weak, even if you just have the simplicity, say, I know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins and I will not depart him. I don't, I don't care what all goes down. I'm going to cling to Jesus Christ. I'm going to cling to the simple commands. So today, what is said today, if you will hear his voice, the repeat. So verse 15 quotes the exact same verse as verse 7 did. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Now this word here, there, that idea of rebellion, it means this, obstinate refusal. Obstinate refusal. So when Jesus talks to you and he says to you, hey, Hey, Seth, what you're doing right there? And maybe he doesn't really talk to me that way. You know, maybe he talks to you that way. But for me, it's just like in that quietness of mind. says, hey, that's not, that's not godly. That's not right. That's sin for you. See, it's a very sobering thing when I get alone with the Lord. And it might be that you would see, you know what? Are you obstinate over the revealed scriptures that give you commands and promises? Are you hardened? Are you refusing today to hear what Jesus says and, and do it? Now, here's the lesson. Could he be talking to all of us? Could he be talking to me? Could he be talking to me only? And I think verse 16 helps us out. Moses, again, now we're going we're gonna to draw these parallels. For who, having heard, rebelled? Speaking of the children of Israel, who heard what God said? Well, they were all at the mountain, were they not? Were they not all at the mountain, camped around the mountain? Did they all not have their representatives and the elders? Did they all not hear God speak and the mountain shook and they were incredibly fearful? And they said to Moses, we're afraid. You hear from God. Tell us what he said, please. And God says, good. If only my people would always fear me like this and they would be so careful to find out what I said to them and they would be so careful to obey what I said. And that's what happened in Moses' day. And all of them came out of Egypt. All of them saw the 10 miraculous plague miracles judging the gods of Egypt with God's own right arm, bringing out his own people. They saw the salvation. Have you seen the salvation? the cross of Jesus Christ saving you. You understand this. Who, who rebelled? Was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Every one of them who rebelled came out of Egypt. Think about that. 
They all saw, they all saw the power of God. That's not enough, is it? Believing in the miracles of God is not enough to save you. To, to hang on in this thing, it, it comes down to this, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna hear his voice? Are you gonna refuse his word? Or are you gonna keep his word? Now, picturesque here. Now, to, with whom was he angry 40 years? Can you imagine God's anger upon you for 40 years? That's what it was for the children of Israel. He judged them for 40 years. Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? See, who doesn't get into the sheepfold? Jesus says that he who tries to climb in another way, that, that he's a robber. See, there's only one way in, and for you and I as Christians, there's one way in, and that word say, how do we get in? We get in by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how we get in. We obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Could not enter in. Could not enter in because of their hardness of heart. Now, literally there it is because they did not have faith. So chapter four, as we go into this, explains this. They could not enter in because they didn't believe. Even though they saw it, even though they had the miracles, they didn't believe that God was able. He says, go up into the promised land. They could not believe that God was able to do that. See, Christian, do you believe that God is able to take you from today and see you into eternity in Christ Jesus? You believe it. So you exercise that faith, you strengthen that faith, and then along comes these trials, along come the sufferings of this life, along comes stuff that, that if you weren't attached to the rock would blow you off the rock. That depth of, of emotion, that depth of pain, that experience, what you're experiencing, and I'm bringing you back to this simplicity of the rock of Jesus Christ to hear him and cling because the children of Israel didn't do it. In fact, they saw all that, they had all the miracles, they had water out of the rock, they had the law, they had the tabernacle. Can you, can you imagine this? Every single day, they had their marching orders. If the cloud moves, you move. If the fire moves, you move. See, what does a shepherd do with for his sheep every single day? Every single day, the shepherd goes ahead of the sheep, calls them out, takes them out to pasture, they follow his voice, and he leads them back to the fold. Go in and out and find pasture. Christian, what do you have to do? Same thing. It's that simple. It's that straightforward. For the children of Israel, all they had to do was follow God's leading, and they, he gave them a visible representation. They had all that. They saw all that. They had all that, and yet they still wouldn't follow. So I'm not surprised when we have this in our Christianity where we have the Spirit of God, we have the Word of God, we have what Jesus says, and we have the Good Shepherd going before us, and what do we need to do? Simply be led by him and follow him. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to come short of it. Man, if I could duplicate, if I could replicate that experience of the children of Israel at the mountain of Sinai and just replicate what? The fear of hearing God's word, hearing God speak. Just the fear of saying, when I open my Bible, this is God's word. When the spirit of God speaks, it's, it's God speaking to me. When Jesus leads me and Jesus says, this is how you should live, this is the way, walk in it. All the things that are here, if I would have that fear for the word of God, say, this is what God said to me, I can't derail this. I, I, I gotta cling to this. Since there remains a rest, a promise of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, speaking of Israel, but the word which they heard did not profit them not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So the gospel is still the gospel, but you have to believe and trust and, and walk into that. For we who have believed, so this is by faith, we who have believed do enter that rest, just as he has said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day, from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest, since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, today, after such a long time as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Now, I'll pause there simply to clarify that there is a rest for the people of God and Joshua, it wasn't about the promised land. David comes along later and talks about this rest and we know that it's by faith in Christ Jesus and now I put you into this today. I, I purposely have done this because the context of the scriptures, Jesus is the good shepherd. And, and this is what it comes down to. 
that if you today have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, you follow him, you believe him, you trust him, what he did on the cross for you pays the penalty for your sin, you enter in through the gate. You're, you're, you're in, you're, you have salvation. Now what do you do? Continue to follow the good shepherd. Whatever he tells you to do, do that. So at this place of rest, and it's found in the person of Jesus Christ and by faith in him, um, what comes down to it, some will enter, some will not. Now this is the hardest part for a pastor. You know, I, I give the word of God, I, I personally, um, from the pulpit, I listen to the word of God, I speak into your lives, I, I, I can see things into your lives, and you guys, this is the body of Christ. And the word of God, and what will you do with the word of God, and the commands of God's word, and what will you do with it? Well, it says that for he who has entered his rest, so the person who enters the rest of Christ and has found in him, has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. So it's not by my works, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So that which is begun in the spirit, what, what's then the exhortation to you and I? Continue in the spirit. It isn't like you come to Christ and then, and then all of a sudden you have to do good works as a Christian to, to secure a position to remain. No, the place is very straightforward that it is his work in you and it's his finished work. And that word there when it says, uh, next verse, let us therefore be diligent. The King James says, let us labor to enter that rest. It literally means to give the effort it takes to be found in Christ and Christ alone. Now, that's my encouragement to you today, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. So if, if the word was disobeyed when God spoke through Moses and God spoke from the mountain and they had the mirac miraculous power of God and they would not listen to God, they had all the commands and they would not obey God, who are we now today to think that we would go a different direction? The only way we will is if today we'll get into our hearts and say, this is what Jesus has said. This is the way. This is the scriptures. The scriptures, this is how we walk. And wouldn't it be that we come to this place, and the writer to Hebrews 4.12, we come to this place for a purpose because this is where we need to be at every single day where the word of God is living and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. So in the context of the writer of Hebrews using the word of God, Saying this, he says, today if you will hear the Holy Spirit's voice, right? The Holy Spirit says, and where does he go? Psalm 95. Maybe today you're reading Proverb 5 because Proverb 5 is, is the fifth of the month and you read Proverb 5 and you read things in there and say, that's the word of God. One of those verses in there, God, man, God, I got to do that. Maybe today you're reading other places in the scripture. Maybe you're reading ahead for Hebrews, but do you have, have you set that place where you and God and in your devotional closet and your, your prayer life and everything where God's word comes to you or when you come to a sermon, whether it's here in person or you're listening to teachings online, whatever it is, we say where God's word speaks, it is sharp, it's living, and it's powerful. Sharper than a two-edged sword. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, cuts both ways. And literally here in, in what it says is that it is a two-edged sword piercing even the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, I can't do this for you. I, I can do it for myself. I can't do it for you. I can encourage you. I can exhort you. Just like the writer here to Hebrews. I can't do this for you. He can tell you about it. He can introduce you to it. He can, he can warn you about it. He can, he can give you all these things. Moses couldn't do it for the children of Israel. Moses could intercede for the children of Israel. He fasted and prayed and saved their lives. He could communicate the heart of God. He could communicate the words of God. Jesus came fulfilling the, the very nature and will of God, and Jesus gave a message, and there's a message of the cross that he brought, and yet he still can't do it for you. And what is that part that you have to do for yourself? You have to answer and hear and follow. And I can't do that for you. I, I mean, you want me to come over and read the Bible to your devotions because you don't have a devotional life? You want me to, Pastor, I just, I just don't read my Bible. And I mean, how many times do you come to this and say, I have in my possession the very word of God? And, and does that affect you? As somewhere, somewhere in there, you have to hear and listen and say, this is the word of God. It's living and powerful. From Genesis to Revelation, all of it is sharp. I mean, the Spirit of God can take, I mean, you read through any part of the Bible and there could be any scripture, anything that would actually cut right to the issue of your heart, dividing what's right, what's wrong, discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so what am I saying to you today? In your relationship with Jesus Christ, you also will have a relationship to hearing from God in his word. 
Now, trust me, it is the Holy Spirit who applies the word of God into your hearts. I'm not discounting the Holy Spirit, nor will I discount the word of God. In fact, when we seek to separate that, we usually miss how the Holy Spirit will work and use them together. So today, don't harden your hearts. What's the warning from today? Don't harden your heart. Be careful of disobedience. Are you hearing what Jesus said and are you doing it? Because, man, this, this comes to me too. And I know it's a broken record today. I, I know it's a broken record. But this is a broken record I'll, I'll listen to over and over because it repeats. And I, I like that. I'll hear the same thing. And I come to the Bible now. I come to the word of God just like you do and say, Jesus, teach me. My, my prayer, I taught my kids early on. It's, and it was like, it was fun because this is the only prayer they knew. When we opened the Bible, it was, and then I would have them all pray it. And it did move around from night to night, but it was, Jesus, will you teach us by your Holy Spirit? And then we'd open up the Bible and, and let him teach. See, today if you will hear his voice and not harden your heart, and the word of God is living and powerful, and know this, no creature is hidden from his sight. There's nothing hidden. Everything's naked and open to him. Uh, eyes of him to whom he much give an account. God is going to call to account that which he's entrusted to you. And I've been entrusted with a lot. I mean, the stuff that as I teach, and, and that's why Paul says to Timothy, it's that let not many of you become teachers. So that which is entrusted, required, and, and so to give an account for the word of God. You mean that you're going to be held to account for what he spoke to you? Yeah. Yeah. Now, where's our hope? Well, verse 14 says, seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. So we began today with beginning with our confession, and now the whole thing is the trials of this life, the temptations, even where you failed, forgiveness of sin, recovering in the grace of God, being restored into the place of, God, I've backslidden. Man, I know 10 years of backsliding. I know sin. I know forgiveness of sin. I know the power of God over sin. I know all that. And now that's why, even more so, I, I appeal to you this. Let us hold fast our confession. You know, I'm not going to die for many things. I'm not going to draw the line on, on many things out there. You might think that I have opinions like you, and, and this is sort of a, a tendency of the body of Christ where, well, the world does it too, portrays our own values onto other people. But you know where I draw the line? I draw the line at the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's my confession. That's where I draw the line. That's what I'll die for. That's, that's where I'll draw the line. And I'll, well, for my family too, I'll lay down my life and, and, I'll, and for the church. Right? That, that's, where I'll, that's where I'll draw the line. So if you hold fast to confession, confession of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Hey, I know you're weak. I'm weak. Don't, mis, don't misunderstand my tone as I exhort and I encourage to the scriptures. We're weak. And our weakness of flesh is such, we're prone to sin. There's no temptation that's overtaken you except such as common to man. Jesus Christ is tempted in all ways as we are, yet without sin. Verse 15. He was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. You don't think he can't sympathize with what you're going through? It's too hard. I'm tired. See, yes. Can you imagine Jesus? Like, what, what if Jesus offered up that to, to God the Father that night in the garden? Father, I'm just, I'm tired. I had a bad day at work. Now, I'm not belittling you, but I do want to shake you. And I want to bring you to the word of God and I want to bring you to Christ and I want you to know this about uh, that. Let's just, let's be strengthened today as Christ is, sympathizes with our weaknesses. He knows he sees, he knows the temptations and why not look for the way of escape? Why not look to him and say, Jesus, help. Help me out in this matter. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Every third minute. Isn't it sometimes what it is? You get in the middle of something, you know it's, if you, if you fall for this temptation, you know it's sin. And you know you're gonna sin against God's word. And so, can I go boldly before the throne of grace to find help? Yeah, because our high priest has gone in with the blood, the way is made open. The Bible says that we pass into the whole of holies through the veil, which is his flesh. Died as a man, making the way. We pass through into the holy of holies to find help. Now, as we wrap this up today, it's like, Okay, so what has Jesus said? I could pull, I could pull the entire New Testament, uh, what Jesus said, and you could say, okay, I gotta get all that. Now, have you heard three simple things from Jesus? And the first one is today, Jesus says, come to me. So in your weakness, if you're weary, heavy laden, trials, sufferings, uh, it's got you weighed down, 
Jesus gives a very clear thing. If that's you today and you're weary and you're troubled and everything I'm saying to you and I have frustrated you completely today because you don't read your Bible and you're upset at me now because of everything and exhortations and, and three and four has just rebuked you up and down and you're like, you're just beat up right now. You're weary and you're heavy laden because you haven't been with Christ. Simply hear him today. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. So when you say, I'm just tired, do you know that's not the place of rest? Do a self-diagnosis. Help yourself hear what you need to hear about yourself. You realize the church, five out of seven in Revelation, the letters he gave, they, didn't, they couldn't even self-evaluate. That's why the Spirit, that's why Jesus sent a message because they, they couldn't actually self-evaluate their situation. So if you would hear this today and if you're weary, heavy laden, troubled and, and life's got you down and, and your own sin, you've been yielding to sin and temptation got you down, Jesus simply says, come to me. It doesn't end there. He says, come to me, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. He is meek. And he wants you to get all that and he wants you to be yoked with him and submit yourself unto him and trust him in all things and simply come to him and say, Jesus, I follow you. I'll be yoked to you. Where you go, I go. Where you lead, I follow. Jesus, I'm yoked with you. I, that's it. I come to you. I entrust it all to you and I, I receive your promise that you will give rest for my soul. Most helpful today, most helpful today. And then now here's another one. So remember, I'm not, I'm not giving you everything, I'm giving you something. And he says, come to me, how about this one? As a disciple of Jesus Christ, the call's the same. As it was in the beginning, is still the same today. Follow me. That's all Jesus says to you, follow me. You find out today where Jesus is leading, right? If that means that your methods of seeking God's voice in your life is to follow Jesus Christ and do what he says is, is to follow me. It begins with what he said first. Take up your cross, right? deny yourself, and follow me. You can hear that today. You can, you can hear this, and maybe today you have to go back and deny self all over again. And it just is that. You're the good shepherd. I want to follow after you. Where you go, I go. Where you lead by your voice, I follow. And I'm encouraging you and strengthening you because if you haven't been following the good shepherd, what are you following then? There's no other options. You end up following a different voice. And now the last one. Again, I'm not giving you everything. I'm giving you three. I'm giving you something to take with you today. And it's this. Jesus says, abide in me. So you can put them together. He says, come to me, follow me. And now the last one, abide in me. How close can you get? And it really is that. As you progress in this relationship, first you come to him and you hear him, you confess your sin, you get saved, and you, you deny yourself, take up your cross, you, you, does, you die to sin, and you live with Christ and you follow him. Wherever he goes, you go, you follow. Jesus, how do you want me to do that? How do I please you? How do I do this? Can you hear his voice in the scriptures? Because now he simply comes along and says, where we're getting to and where this all is about is this place of abiding in oneness with me. Jesus says, abide with me. See, if you can't hear come to me and you can't hear follow me, you'll probably never hear what? Abide in me. Abide with me. See, what is Jesus saying? Can you hear him today? I mean, can you, can you go back and, and say, Jesus, man, I've been reading the Bible, Lord, and I'm sorry, I've been reading the Bible and I, I've been reading it all the wrong way because I can no longer hear you when I read the Bible. And I, I want to abide in you. And here's how he has me abiding in him this month. Right? Here's how he has me abiding in him this month is he took me aside in this exercise of God and godliness in, in my life and he took me aside to this thing called holiness and just teaching me how to abide in him and to trust him and love him to be ho holy and set apart for him and Christ in me working that out and I just share that with you because what is he working in your life what can you simply say is here's here's the exercise of godliness only because I follow Jesus Christ this is coming about and know this that when you follow him and love him and serve him, don't be surprised when the world hates you. Don't be surprised at the sufferings. In fact, the trials will increase. So the, to the persecuted church here writing to the Hebrews, it is just that. They need to be told that, that Christ can sympathize with their weaknesses and he can help them as they're being tempted and you today can be helped, you as the temptations come into your life and the sin will come. I mean, trust me, everything about today's everything, the word of God comes to you, wherever the word of God found your heart today, It'll be challenged. And you'll have to make a choice if the, if the bird's going to snatch that seed away, cares of this world, or if it's actually going to find good soil. So 